Okay, so a warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us today uh, for the fifth, um, well, for day one of the uh, fifth uh, Asia Dengue Summit, um, from broadcasting live from uh, Singapore here today. We've had a packed uh, day. Uh, we've had some excellent presentations today, ranging from Wolbachia, uh, community engagement around those particular projects to clinical insights, a deep dive into that, predicting dengue severity risks, um, looking at dengue pathogenesis in terms of targets, and also a kind of very interesting kind of multi-aspect look at NS1 uh, earlier in the day. Um, what was apparent, there was a very interesting session as well on a new NS1 RDT uh, earlier in the day, uh, and that was... Uh, the midday time here with a Fuji film, and it kind of underlined the uh, absolute need for a, uh, a better diagnostic framework, a diagnostic approach uh, for dengue. Um, and certainly in Singapore, I'm sure many of you who are from this area who are joining us um, would know that in February, the, there was this whole uh, boost in terms of regional outlook on the global crisis for diagnostics today, it's certainly not just in Southeast Asia, it's right across the world. We've been very fortunate um, in, in, in our kind of, um, kind of uh, engagement in this space where we've had uh, the, the, the good fortune of uh, being the external partners for some of the Digital Diagnostics for Africa a network based in Imperial College London. Uh, and through that relationship, we were able to bring in today a very interesting speaker in terms of this particular session looking at um, molecular diagnostics at point of care. Um, and I'd like to kind of, um, you know, hand over the, the floor and introduce the, the speaker for this session, Dr. Nicholas Moser, who's a research associate in diagnostic technology at the Center for Bio-Inspired Technology Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Imperial College London. Um, he's also the co-founder and chief technical officer of Proton DX. That's the startup vehicle that's currently trying to bring the, the, the test that they're, they're developing there uh, to reality, uh, to market. Um, I think that's enough for me, and I'd like to kind of hand over to uh, Dr. Moser. So, Nicholas, are you are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you loud and clear. So thanks a lot for joining us from sunny London. It's very hot here in Singapore, but um, thanks a lot for making time. And I'll just hand over the floor to you and I'll back out and come on back in um, for the for the Q&A. Uh, just bear with me while I uh, just do that. And just, I just, just before I do that, I'd just like to say thanks a lot to all of the audience who are making time today to join us. Very, very kind of you to do that. If I could ask you to just to, in the chat box, put your name, affiliation, country, where you're from, it just makes for a bit more of an immersive feel. And we will be asking you to put in some questions. The Q&A is designed for you. So thanks a lot, everybody. Round of applause to everybody. I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Moser. Nicholas, over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Cameron. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for, for attending. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. So hopefully you can see that. I'm going to assume so. Please chat if, if you can't. Um, great. So I think Cameron's very nicely introduced me already. Um, I think uh, the first thing I want to mention before I start the talk is perhaps my slightly unusual background. So I'm an electronic engineer by training. As a result, I got um, very into the diagnostics and the molecular biology side of this project as I went along. That was doing my PhD and doing my postdoc, which I'm now doing at Pearl College London. As such, I think perhaps I hope I can bring a slightly different approach to this, but also um, I want to mention all the work that's been done in microfluidics or in molecular biology in my talk was part of the group in which I'm in, and I will acknowledge everybody at the end. So this is very much an incredible effort from a whole team of people. So the talk is going to be about molecular diagnostics at the point of need, which in 2022 is such a huge problem um, globally. I think I don't want to say too much about the dengue side of it because I'm sure all the audience here is absolutely familiar with all the problems. That being said, there are many diagnostic solutions that exist currently that may be implemented perhaps in labs, centralized laboratories. However, the real problem that we're trying to look at here is the particular context of rural health. How do we 
design your diagnostic test, which can be accessed in remote settings, in schools, perhaps in clinics, even in the middle of Southeast Asia or, or Africa, which is kind of the environment we've been looking at when we very much started this project, um, might it be for dengue, um, which is the subject of this particular conference, or malaria as well. So very briefly, I mentioned most of the conventional methods are used in a lab. So perhaps the um, at one end of the spectrum is conventional methods, which may be cell culturing, which of course take a lot of time, expertise, or lab dependence, however, are quite sensitive solutions. And the other side, there is the rapid detection test, which I think here in the UK at least has become kind of the most used solution in the pandemic, um, the very recent pandemic. People have been given for free rapid detection tests in lateral flows. Um, at home, they very quickly learn how to use them. And, you know, in under 30 minutes, they were able with minimal expertise to use the test, provide a result. However, that result is, if it's antibody, it's both infection. If it's antigen, it's quite low sensitivity result. It will detect very fast in the stage of infection. And it's also a qualitative result, not necessarily obvious how infected the patient is. And in the middle, there is what I would perhaps call the gold standards, which are the molecular methods, particularly um, real-time PCR, which again, are quite a lengthy process. So the time in itself of the reaction might be two hours, but usually due to the need for a lab, it takes shipping the sample there, having people to run it. So in practice, once you're at home in remote settings, it will actually take several days. It's a high cost instrument, but which requires expertise lab. However, it is, highly specific, highly sensitive. So what we're trying to do when, as engineers designing a new test, we're trying to kind of get the best of both worlds of the right of the screen, having the sensitivity of the molecular methods, but the ease of use of rapid detection tests and trying to find a middle ground. As I mentioned here in the UK, mass testing has really been on antigen tests through lateral flow tests. And while this is probably obvious for, for most of you, um, just to, to hammer on it, the big difference between antigen tests and molecular tests is, is of course in sensitivity and molecular tests allow to detect the infection much earlier, whether that is COVID or dengue, um, any kind of infection really. And that's why this particular talk, everything that we talk about will be molecular tests. So we are very much working on nucleic acid detection as opposed to detecting antigens or, or antibodies. So what we need are molecular tests with the portability and scalability. I haven't mentioned that so far, but when we're looking at markets such as um, low income countries, we need to have a solution that's fully scalable. So portability and scalability of antigen tests and I might add ease of use. So I think the short criteria has been used in a lot of different ways now, but originally it was developed by the World Health Organization for tests for STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections. And still, it's quite nice to have a look at when designing the new test. So for abilities and safety specificity, user-friendly, we mentioned all these rapid, robust, equipment-free, available to end users, and quite a few of those tests now add the connectivity aspect as well to allow for surveillance. And we'll definitely talk about this in, in this presentation as well. So this is the part where we start talking a bit about the solution. And what we've been looking at in the group as absolute electronic engineer is using CMOS industry. CMOS stands for Comprehensive Metal Oxide Semiconductor. So it is essentially what the electronic market is using now as the main technology. It's what's in your phone, in all the processors, in all the cameras, in all the laptops as well. And that's the solution that we're starting with to develop a new diagnostic test. At the core of it all is one device called the transistor. And the transistor allows for all this electronics of 2022 to operate. Um, it, it is what is contained in microprocessors, which allows it for trillions of operations per second. A transistor now goes down to seven nanometer, which um, is probably the feature length used by Apple, although I think they might've gone to two nanometer recently. We'd have to confirm that. Um, and so in your phone, there are over a hundred billion transistors. So there are more transistors in your phone than human on this planet. And that's allowed by a law called Moore's law, which is very standard in electronics, um, which says that the number of transistors in dense circuits doubles every two years. So if you move on in time, 
you can pack more transistors in the same area, which means more processing in the same area. Why is this important? Because we're now linking this to diagnostics and we're talking about scalability. So whatever we design now for diagnostics actually relies on trillions of dollars of investment that have gone from the past decade into making these systems smaller, more efficient. And what we design now will also become more scalable in the next few years. And that's why this is kind of an ideal technology when, when designing a new diagnostic test. So as I said, I'm in uh, Professor Georgiou's lab and um, it's kind of the lab has three main pillars. So using bio-inspired design to develop integrated sensing systems, which is what we're doing here, sensing for diagnostics, but also all types of wearable medical devices, including for athletes or um, vital monitoring, but also diabetes um, management through injection of, of, of glucose. The particular part I want to talk about now when talking about diagnostics is lab on chip technology. We've mentioned the chip part, which is the electronics, same technology as what's in your phone, but now we're packing up a lab on top of that chip. Because everything is microscopic, the chip is a very small entity, we're actually able to pack up the entire reaction, everything that happens in the big instrument, but in a, in a tiny volume. At the interface between electronics, which is at the bottom of this graph, and molecular biology, detecting all sorts of biomarkers. And of course, um, perhaps let me first give you a, a small example of how this works. Um, this on the left shows one of the chip, an example of one of the electronic chips we're working on. And what you see here in the middle is an array of a certain amount of pixels. Here there's over a thousand pixels. And you're very familiar with cameras, which are able to image in real time the light that's detecting by the sensors. Well, in this particular case, you can actually see it the same way, but instead of a light camera, this is a chemical camera. So we'll be placing all sorts of solutions at the top. Half the solutions happen at the surface of the chip and the sensors will pick up in real time what happens electrochemically inside the reaction. Let me just give you a, a quick example. It's actually an ion reaction and we made parts of the chip surface sensitive to potassium. Then we injected potassium and you can tell in real time that all the sensors here are highly sensitive to, to potassium. And there are other membranes that use selectively conditioned parts of the array. But this new camera can be used for a wide variety of reactions. That's why in the previous slide I said biomarkers. But when we're looking at diagnostics, I've said that already, we're going to be detecting nucleic acids. So I'm going to place a nucleic acid reaction within the um, lab on a chip platform on the surface of, of the microchip. And we're going to perform a DNA amplification reaction, which all of you are probably familiar um, when we're looking at PCR, for example. So microchips for, diagnostic, for DNA diagnostics um, are ideal for point of care because they can produce handheld device without the need for a lab. They, as we just showed, showed through the video, have real-time detection capability. They can be scalable. I showed a thousand sensors, but similarly, we can increase, and we will do that later in the presentation. And um, the particular sensor we're using is the ion sensitive field effect transistor. You remember the word transistor from how I talked about this device being able to increase computation in electronic systems, but we've actually turned it into a sensor. Without getting too technical, um, this is what the sensor looked like here, um, cross section of a normal chip. And what we're gonna do at the surface of that sensor is induce a amplification reaction now, as I said, you're familiar with PCR. Well, this is not exactly PCR. It's an isothermal alternative. It's called LAMP, which is now quite used for point of care. And so with every incorporated nucleotide during the amplification, a proton gets released. And the proton is actually what we use to create an electric signal on the chip. So every proton release will bind onto the surface of the chip, create an electronic signal, and we'll pick that up. So we're detecting DNA, converting it to an electronic signal. It does not require expensive instruments, no need for optical. This is completely electrochemical. It is high specificity because LAMP requires more requirements than PCR. Our digital detection limit is quite similar to PCR and it's very fast. It can actually be done in under 10 minutes. They're not based on cycles anymore, it's, it's a minute. Um, and we don't need to perform temperature cycling, which is also ideal for point of care. So this is just what I showed you before, the lamp reaction happening at the surface of the chip with the protons going on the surface. The selectivity to the ion is provided by the surface of the sensor, which by default is to protons, which means that there's no processing of the chip when they come back from the foundry. 
and that removes a step in the fabrication and also reduces the cost. This on the right is the particular chip we started using. And again, the same pattern on the left side of a array of pixels, which is detecting what happens at the surface in real time. Now, this particular chip already has an increase in sensors. We have over 4,000 sensors in here. And this particular chip was my PhD. So this is how, how this all started for me. So if we now take a step back and see how the particular chip detection would fit in a diagnostic solution, um, we start from any type of samples. In this case, it's a swap, but um, in the case of Dengue, it would be a bad sample. Process the sample through a sample extraction module, which we'll get back into later in this presentation. And then step two is the detection. So the microchip detection is done through um, nucleic acid amplification. There can be a panel of pathogens, because if you think about it, we can have different wells running at the surface of the chip. Then it sends to a mobile device, such as a smartphone, which is able to read the data and distinguish which diseases in each well, provide that onto a cloud server for real-time mapping of epidemics. So this is kind of how it fits. And I want to go a little bit more into how we implemented each part of the system, and then I will demonstrate that for the particular application of Dengue. So remember, LOC stands for lab on a chip, and this is how we implemented our, our lab on a chip cartridge. If you look first at the actual picture of the chip um, of the cartridge, this is where the chip is that I showed you just before. And then we place a simple plastic acrylic manifold at the surface with, with one well. So what happens on the surface of the chip, again, is an, a real-time lamp assay, which we also called RTE lamp for electronic lamp. The RNA is transcript, um, has, uh, goes through the step of reverse transcription into DNA and then is amplified isothermally. At the surface of the microchip, this creates um, an electrical signal. And this is kind of a little circuit we use in this 4,368 of these circuits on the chip. So we're very much talking of a microscopic solution. Now that cartridge fits into a device. And because the device has very standard components and um, it is standard electronic components, it can actually be made handheld. So this was the first iteration of the device when we ran the validation, which we consider being a handheld point of care device. As you can see here, this is where the cartridge fits. And there is a heater below that cartridge within the device that allows to heat up the cartridge and then the chip and then the actual reaction. We perform regulation such that the well can be at 63 degrees and the amplification happens, which is, um, that's the temperature at which lamp happens. And there is a Bluetooth connection to the smartphone app, which processes the results and sync to a cloud server to provide patient information. Um, as I said before, the goal here, of course, is to have kind of equivalent performance to your lab instruments. And you can see a head-to-head -head comparison of what you'd get from your lab, so a non-template control negative, and then a positive amplification. This is for an AMR gene, but the concept stays the same for all kind of targets and then a head-to-head -head comparison of what this looks like on the chip with a red negative and a, a blue positive. Now, perhaps a little bit about the data processing, not too much, um, but just for, for the interested of you, um, the electrochemical signal does not come as a perfect amplification curve. There's many non-idealities with it. One of these is sensor drift. So what you see here is, um, you know, in the first four minutes, nothing happens and yet, the outputs, the raw output of the chip goes down. That's because there is drift with the sensors. And drift is often difficult to, to compensate for because it's the same kind of speed as the actual signal. So there are real challenges that come with signal processing. And we have simple methods. We are now implementing learning methods to, to improve the sensitivity. And so what you see here is a signal created with amplification, which counteracts the drift. So the orange part is the drift. The blue is what actually happens on the signal. The output signal is associated with DNA amplification and then final drift. So from here on, we can yield the actual amplification curve, which we linearize to get the equivalent of what the PCR machine would give you. Time to positive being cross special methods of here just about five minutes. This is just to show you a little pipeline of what happens behind the scene. Um, We've implemented a whole Amazon Web Service server for the Dengue work. So the smartphone app directly talks to the server to store the information and is accessible through a web interface afterwards. I want to focus um, 
a little bit among all these pathogens that we've worked on. So we've worked on AMR, TB, malaria. I want to focus a little bit on, on dengue here. Um, we're actually just um, soon going to have a paper out on dengue. So these are kind of the results um, a little bit early. So a few years ago, we actually did a very first validation for the device. You saw here, this was a bit more proof of concept device. It's not the nice one you saw before. Um, so we did proof of concepts in Taiwan. We ran the particular proof of concept for dengue from samples from Thailand. And this is kind of some of the results that I, I want to share. On the left is serotype one, on the right is serotype two. These are the two serotypes we focused on. And then the first line is the RTQ lamp. So this is just in the PCR machine. The last line is the RTE lamp, which is our actual device, the electronic lamp. So the assay we had for dengue one is a linear assay, dengue two similarly. And we obtained similar performance with the electronic lamp in both dengue one and dengue two with R squared value of almost one and very similar um, numbers in terms of time to positive. So the device had a time to positive of about one to two minutes later, which is due to a slightly slower heating um, at the start of the reaction. This is for synthetics. This was to show limit of detection. So we show limit of detection of 100 copies per reaction. And then moving on then to a clinical validation, we ran a small amount, um, nine clinical samples there in, in Taiwan. And this on the top is the RTQ lamp, so the result in a PCR machine, and at the bottom is the RTE lamp. So we show quite a good cor correlation in terms of the shape of the curves in both devices. And on the right is the actually time to positive. So for clinical samples, we had a bit more variability in R square of 0 0.8. And um, generally, we had time to positive very fast from 3 to, to 10 minutes. So this demonstrates the detection of dengue from clinical samples in, in under 10 minutes in all, all cases. These were extracted clinical samples. The extraction was done externally. It's promised I will talk about um, integrated sample extraction uh, a bit later. The, just a few views on the Android application. We very much focus on being able to integrate that as part of a map, not just a cloud server. So our actual application allows to, to show in real time where the results were taken. So you can see here the synthetic validation was done at the Center for Vines Biotechnology in London. And this is kind of the map on all the experiments we ran in the papers. We ran synthetic validation in London and then nine clinical samples in Taiwan. So perhaps a simplistic view as the number of samples is still quite small, but we're working on um, scalability and being able to you know, provide more as, as we increase the amount of validations. As I said, the manuscript is actually under review, and we hope to be able to share it soon, probably in a few weeks. Uh, hopefully, it'll be out on Frontiers of Bioengineering and Biotechnology. Um, I mentioned this was our first validation. We actually did quite a few since then. So we validated a device for malaria as well in Ghana. I just want to show you a quick video. Um, it was still in the lab, but these are just some, some of our molecular biologists um, using a several iterations of the device on the bench. You can see them in, um, injecting the extracted sample, having a phone connected by Bluetooth to, to each of the device. So just a bit of a illustration of how I ran the validation. For us, a big change came around the COVID-19 pandemic, because up to now, our focus was very much learning from countries, but then we started to have an application which was closer to home and perhaps easy for us to, to provide development on the device, um, considering the importance of the pandemic. So we started working on a COVID assay after the dengue and malaria ones and managed to provide an assay that detects in under 20 minutes. And we released a paper in ACS, ACS Central Science, which show you a little bit of our, of our results. So this is the correlation between the RTQ lamp and RTQ PCR, so lamp versus PCR assay. And on the right is, again, the positive time to positivity on our device and the one on the PCR machine being quite similar with, again, slight, slight delay on, on our side. The average time to result was 13 minutes, just under 13 minutes. Sensitivity was high, so was specificity. This was actually done with clinical samples as well. So please have a look if, if you're interested. Um, by that time, we managed to increase our multiplexing capabilities to two wells. So this actually shows you not just one, but two macroclinic wells at the surface of the chip, which with one that was sample, one that was controlled. So the processing I showed you before can now be done on a well basis, 
with the positive result and the negative control with every reaction. So I hope I've kind of convinced you that what we've been trying to do is develop a molecular diagnostic solution, which can be taken to different places where you need to perform diagnosis rapidly, sensitively, um, with high specificity and also quantitative. So you can actually get a CT just like you can on the lab device. The platform is mobile, geotax, that free. Um, it's low cost because it only uses standard electronics for the same reason it's also scalable. And we can adapt to new pathogens because the only part that's specific to new pathogen is the primus, is the molecular biology. The technology is actually the same. So this is just to show you a final workflow. We've been able to work on the device a lot more to work on usability as well. Same comment with the app in, in the past few months. And the first step that I discussed is actually a separate sample extraction module. So what I'm showing here on this slide is a two-step workflow. And we've come up with a very simple sample extraction method that can be done rapidly in under five minutes and without any electricity. So very briefly, this is what we call the smart lid because it requires on a magnetic lid that allows you to move silicon magnetic beads from tube to tube. So at the moment, this starts from a swap because like I said, COVID has really allowed us to, to push the development. So we started with swaps place that in the first tube and then use the magnet to carry the beats from one to the next. And at the end, we take that solution place in insulation to perform the detection. So this is a completely electricity free solution, which we believe is a huge plus, particularly for low income countries. Um, the absence of need for power, the detection of course needs power, but this is the, the sample extraction. So at this point, I kind of want to flip the, the talk just a little bit. Um, because everything I've talked so far was done as part of academic validations. And then as the pandemic came, as I said, it was a huge, a huge transition for us. We were able to talk to Imperial about commercializing all this exciting technology. And so in December, 2020, we managed to create a startup, which we call Proton DX, just for the anecdote, the Proton, if you remember, is because everyone of a reaction releases a Proton and that's how we detect the nucleic acids. And, hence the, the name of the company. So the idea of Proton DX is to carry the message I've told about, I've told you about so far, which is diagnostic at the point of need in between lateral flow test and, and all the lab tests. And for this, we've actually designed a series of tests, not just lacing. So I want to tell you a little bit about that story and, and then I'll, I'll conclude. And you know, what we do is very much at the interface of three and three technologies. I think I've told you a lot about the last one, much of technology, because that's my background. This is particularly what I work on. I've told you quite a bit about the isothermal nucleic acid amplification as well, the lamp. And then there is my fluidics, which we talked about, and the ultra pure DNA sample extraction, still from nasal throat swab, and we designed to be used at a point of care. This was the starlet that I just showed you. So we actually just released our first, first test before lasering, um, which we baptized Dragonfly, you see it's a theme there. And so the, the first motivation before, um, behind Dragonfly was to make a simple test that can be run as most as possible with off-the-shelf components and portable, and also mostly electricity-free. So the idea of Dragonfly is to use tubes similar to that, but have them used by a trained user and then induce a reaction that would change the color to yellow if it's positive or keep the color to pink if it's negative. So we use the extraction I showed you, smart lip with minimal handling. Um, and this allows us to detect very rapidly DNA and RNA because we expect the extraction will take five minutes and the amplification will take 25. Hence why we sum up the 30 in total. We've run this for the first time with a respiratory panel. So COVID, flu, A, flu, B, R, S, V, Ranavirus. So this works on a swap. Answering the question, if not COVID, then, then what is it? This is kind of a look at the platform. So the sample preparation kit that I showed you with the smart lid, a test panel, which are actually a set of strips with um, biophage reagents. And then we work on a tablet to give instructions similarly to the app I showed you before. And then the extra component here, which in a way replaces the electronics, there's the camera of the tablet, and then there is the heater where the strips are placed. So kind of a simple workflow. And this shows you how people would go ahead and run many reactions in parallel. So you see there's a timer, which always informs you where, where you're at. And at the end, you remove from the heater and you read the color 
simply through a cut to say which target was positive, which target was negative. We also have some controls. So we're able to, to confirm that the user took the swap properly or the patient rather. So we're very excited to say that we just finished drank by validation. That's why I really wanted to mention it at this talk because we finished it two weeks ago. And you know, over all the samples, we got a sensitivity of over 97%. And over the actual infectious samples, we had over 99% with limited detection of uh, just under a thousand copies per milliliter. And that validation was used because we could secure a C mark. So we're now officially allowed to sell the product on the market in the EU, which for us starting as a research group many years ago, is such a huge milestone. And we actually had a first sale to Team GB at the Beijing Olympics, an English Institute of Sports for research use only purpose. Now, why, why am I saying all this at a dengue conference? Because COVID for us was kind of a platform, but there is very much huge interest in using this for tropical disease such as dengue in low-income countries and, and remote settings. Remember, that's what we had in, in mind when we designed every test we've done. And that's why we've partnered with, as, a, as Cameron said, Digital Diagnostic for Africa Network to find how exactly to, to perform that implementation and, and talk to using on the field. This was a little dragonfly interlude, but coming back to Lacewing, what you've seen so far was a handheld version, but we've now been working on integrating the sample preparation within Lacewing. And so what you see here on the screen is what I spend all my days on at the moment. So after this talk, I'll come back, I'll go back to the lab. We're, we're currently working on developing the integrated version, try to release it by the start of next year. And this is kind of a little device. I can't really get a good idea of dimension, although you can compare it to, to the phone over there, which is portable, affordable, um, connected as usual. We haven't changed that and for multiple infections. While the first panel is respiratory, we're very much working after that on extended to blood and other panel diseases, common bacteria, common viruses, including dengue. Um, a little look also at our new cartridge. So I told you before we had 4,000 sensors on the chip. This one has 59,000. So as an electronic engineer, this really excites me. But more than ever, what you see on the right is our very first demonstration of 12 wells. Um, on the same chip. So all these green spots are different reaction wells. So that means detecting 12 different targets with two controls. So that's 10, 10 diseases. In total, we'll, we'll actually scale up to 10, not 12. So up to 10 targets happening at the same time with a new onboard heating um, and the microchip's called Titan. So I think I hope I've excited you with all the technology I've presented so far. In terms of next step, um, trying to work as researcher and co-founder as well. Some of the things we're trying to do now is also working on what happens at the early stage of the detection. So while we say, you know, we can detect up to here, here, you do have a certain infectivity, you do have a level of viral load, and we want to be able to detect with the technology as early as possible. And that's why we're working on some new algorithms which involve learning, which we call sensor learning, but also new methods to kind of push down the limited detection even more and be able to act as early as possible in, in the pathways of infections. Not just that, we're, as I said, identifying the deployment strategy in low-income countries with the Digital Diagnostic for Africa Network, who is the reason why I was able to talk today, so thank you very much. And then finalizing Lacewing, extending sample extraction approaches to blood, as I said, towards doing a validation for dengue with the new, the new device. So that's all for me. I want to acknowledge the whole team at Imperial, so Professor George's group, but also the whole Digital Diagnostic for Africa network led by Dr. Aubrey Cunnington. And then lastly, all my colleagues at Proton DX. It's been a crazy work since December 2020 to, to get all that together and actually make a difference with, with all the technology we've been developing. Thank you very, very much, uh, Nick, for that. Um, absolutely wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to agree that the WHO are going to come up with the, have to come up with a different acronym now. You've ticked all the boxes again and again, repeatedly on assured. I think there are a few more letters that are going to have to be added into that. So absolutely fantastic. And I think there are a lot of uh, great kind of feedback coming through um, from the audience. What we love about these broadcasts is that you're able to get access 
uh, in terms of uh, the audience. We've got people from Brazil, uh, Rodrigue, we've got uh, Belen from the DNDI in Geneva. Um, we've got people, uh, Marianne from the ICMT in London joining us. Um, in, from Indonesia, we've got people from Pakistan, we've got people from Sri Lanka. Uh, everybody's on there uh, in terms of uh, from Brazil to Sri Lanka. Uh, it's quite a spread. And it just goes to show you what we're doing is absolutely relevant um, and absolutely fundamental to uh, combating dengue and, uh, and a whole host of uh, other diseases as well. I just want to take it back and we're going to open the Q&A now and uh, the audience have very kindly started putting some questions in which I'm going to come to uh, in a second. I'm just going to ask a quick question, go right to the beginning of your uh, presentation and you mentioned schools and clinics as a target yeah. for usage, for uptake of this uh, the final tech. Yeah. There's obviously a lot of complexity as you've uh, very um, Succinctly shown us in terms of your, the presentation, the CMOS, the pixel, all of the whole kind of the backdrop to it. In terms of getting this out to schools and clinic, clinics, as you've mentioned, one of the kind of uh, issues within the global diagnostics or lack of access to diagnostics at global health uh, challenge level is this kind of expansion that's needed of the health workforce. And hand in glove with that expansion is really this upskilling for new contemporary kind of diagnostic skills. How do you feel in terms of what you have and reaching out to schools and clinics? Is there a training gap? I, I know you kind of alluded to some of that in your presentation. How do you feel about um, impacting the expansion that's required in terms of health uh, care workforce and using these, these kind of diagnostics? No, I think, I think that's a very good question. And honestly, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out with the DIDA network, Digital Diagnostic for Africa. And we have amazing collaborators there from the Gambia, from Ghana, from all around Africa um, to try to help with developing those new technologies. We are, as engineers, of course, trying to make this as user friendly as possible. So that's why working on an integrating device for lacing, for instance, is something that we think is needed for use kind of at by everyone in a way towards used by untrained users, although for now it's very much trained users. Um, the limitation of the technology is, you know, device, phone. For us, that's quite that's quite standard. For people I've met in Africa, it's quite standard as well. But I do imagine there are barriers to use that we're going to discover once we get there. In fact, if it wasn't for the pandemic, we were going to take the device in the boot of a car in schools and find out a little bit more in that was in Ghana. About, about all these things. And then there was this kind of kind of pivot, but we very much need to get back to that once we have the prototype to find out more about deployment and adoption. I think in a way, I'm not really answering your question because there's a lot of things we will learn once we do we do that work. Well, that's a great line. I think you have answered the question actually. You're actually thinking about it and you're moving in that direction. So that's great. Um, just Moving on from that just slightly, and I'm going to come to the questions that people have asked uh, in, in the chat box. In terms of governance, in terms of regulatory frameworks and scale up, um, you mentioned the CE mark uh, briefly uh, towards the end in terms of the Proton DX and, and then the CE mark that you'd worked to, and then that enabled you to get into the Olympics and, and move that forward and sell this in the yeah. EU. In terms of globally, are there, is there a gap in terms of regulatory frameworks? Is there some kind of, not market failure, but is there kind of a uh, lack of support for you there? How do you envisage that as a challenge or as something that's, uh, you know, when you're taking this globally in terms of the regulatory frameworks that are out there? We often hear that there's not enough harmonization in terms of uh, uh, diagnostics at a global level, at a regulatory framework level. How do you feel about that? Is the scaling? I think up? that's definitely true. No, true. It's been difficult to find harmonization among all the countries, of course. I think what we found, and, and that's very much something we're working on at the moment as well, is contacts with world-renowned organizations such as WHO or FINDS or all, all types of other ones are essential when going to learn income countries. Um, we have also been in touch with some, some governments. We have a project in Thailand for Dengue as well, um, which is which is helpful, of course. But I think those world organizations are going to be the key to managing kind of trials and then implementation with, within countries there. 
Yeah, I mean, certainly there seems to be an appetite for it now, not just the Lancet Commission and Diagnostics, but all sorts of activity at diagnostics level. Um, and, I, and I really hope that kind of makes a, a kind of fertile ground for you in terms of scale up. It's a fantastic technology. We've had some great, and you really piqued the interest of the audience as well with that. I just want to come to some of those questions because they very kindly asked those. So I think it's going to um, of course. Gonna, uh, do that. And this the, the classic question, which I think is uh, from Dr. Mohsen Khan um, and actually from Dr. Iman Hamid from Singapore and uh, Pakistan respectively. Uh, so they're both, they're both asking a question in terms of how low would the total cost per assay be, as well as the cost per device? It's a key question when you're talking about LMIX yeah. and scale up. So sure. over to you. All right, so first I want to start about device, because I think where we really differentiate is because the device only has very standard components, it's all electronic, we can actually reduce the cost significantly compared to most of the big Kind of diagnostic device. If you look at biofilm, biofilm film array, for instance, it's like a fifty thousand dollar plus device. I think mean, it's, it's sixty thousand even. Um, so we're looking definitely under a thousand. Um, definitely, probably several hundreds. Now, this is what I'm mentioning. Kind of estimates is that we haven't even finished a prototype for the device, and once we get into a prototype, we then go into small scale manufacture, and then essentially the price of the device all depends on how much we can, how many we can make, and then the partners that we find. So I imagine going into LMIX, we then need to find partners there. So it's very difficult to give actual prices. Um, what I'm trying to say is the devices are meant to be fairly cheap, such that several can be bought for different sites, you know, one per school or, or whatever, as opposed to most of the other tests, which would have one expensive device. Um, not only one per site, but perhaps if we wanted to increase the throughputs, because we just have one sample, we can have several of them, it's modular as well. So perhaps that's on the device side. Um, on the cartridge side, um, at the moment, um, it's also very difficult to say. Yeah. Essentially, the two biggest costs are probably going to be first the reagents, which can be driven down once you start having a certain size and then you can it actually source reagents um, and perhaps assemble them in house rather than getting all reagents from expensive New England biolabs. So I think that's going to be addressed once we get into larger scale. And then similarly, the other big one is assembly of the cartridge. So it turns out that assembling is actually quite a higher cost than the material cost in many cases because the chip can be, you know, lowered down. So again, that's going to go through the partnerships we can go so when talk about l mix if we do go through associations such as fines or or who we hope that we can find partners there that will help with all this um the current ones we have for assembly were in southeast asia and everything depends on scale so once you start talking about one country two countries then i we hope that we can go down to you know uh, a good enough amount for 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 l mix but probably will struggle to go lower than a few tens of pounds per test. Um, I think we will really struggle to go lower to 10 pounds a test. Well, as soon as you mentioned manufacturing in Southeast Asia, I'm sure people are connecting the dots in their mind. I mean, this is the yes. land of CMOS and the manufacturing of transistors and right. you know, DRAM and everything. So perhaps this is the place for that manufacturing based partnership that, that you're alluding to. So that, that, you know, I'm sure people are thinking that already. Um, just moving from that question, and thank you very much for, for Dr. Khan and Iman Hamid for asking that question. Uh, Dr. Niladri Paul from MSD, the multinational pharma company who are actually in the market with a fantastic, dare I say it, vaccine uh, candidate for, for dengue. Some superb results have been coming through on that and, and um, we've met some of the MSD people here today as well. Um, uh, Dr. Niladri Paul's asking, will the device detect different serotypes of dengue? So right. So I think, I think since the start of this year, we've kind of figured out that there will be no diagnostic test that doesn't do multiplexing anymore. So our technology is very much based on allowing multiplexing on whichever test I talked about, drunk fly and lacing. And I showed you you know, this photo of the chip with 12, 10 wells. So 
as far as I'm concerned, the capabilities are 10 targets, and then they will be from here on branching out panels, right? So you can have a respiratory panel with eight diseases, and then a dengue panel, which has the four serotypes, and then perhaps some other targets we want to look at. So we talked, you talked about dengue severity, I think, earlier this day, yeah. today. So thinking of markers for dengue disease severity could be there as well on the panel. Um, so far, we have demonstrated dengue serotype one and two for the paper. However, it's easily extendable to existing assays for dengue three, dengue four, and then it's very possible to have all that on the same cartridge, yes. That's a fascinating uh, um, answer, actually, Nicholas, because earlier in the day, Professor Bridget Wills uh, was presenting um, from the University of Oxford based in Vietnam um, in terms of prediction of dengue severity, uh, risk of dengue severity, and she mentioned 13 clinical um, parameters. And the, one of the questions was, what do you have to include in that modeling in terms of when you're trying to predict um, risk of severe dengue. So uh, maybe there's a dotted line to, to, again, this fits so nicely yeah. into all of that. So perhaps there's a lot more conversations that need to be had around that. Um, there are lots of different questions coming through. I'm just going to ask another one now. So just I'm jumping from topic to topic. Forgive me, but I just want to be fair to everybody who's kind of no questions in. So from Dr. Yes. Shobicha Aldila Wollandhandri, um, does lacewing come with one device that able to detect, uh, that's able then to detect many have pathogens. I think you just answered that. I saw from the photo yes. that SARS-CoV-2 lacewing is a specific device for SARS-CoV-2. Can lacewing detect pathogen causing febrile illness, i.e. Differentia uh, differentiating differential diagnosis of febrile illness, which is probably the key yes. factor between when you have these COVID um, outbreak, the COVID backdrop and dengue season in, in, in these areas of the world. It's a huge issue. Um, and so, yeah, so I think you've answered that, but if you just want to add something to that, Nicholas, you know. Of course, okay. yeah. So, so again, kind of COVID for us was what en enabled us to develop all this technology because it turned us into a startup much faster than it would have otherwise, full honesty. So it is our first panel, respiratory panel. However, it's our first of many panels. So we will have absolutely febrile illnesses. That depends, of course, on the geography. I mean, the incidence is very different in London than, than in Elmix, but uh, we will definitely be developing ones in Elmix. In, in a way, again, I said I'm the electronic guy, so I see this as a platform rather than a one test, right? And the only thing that changes is the primer you put in and then you change the panel. Yes, yeah, so you've got all the avenues open to you, and I, I totally get that perspective Correct. as well. And I thought, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, way to look at it, actually, because you don't have that baggage of molecular biology with you. Saying that, I'm about to throw one at you from Dr. Ida uh, Safitri Laksono, a pediatrician who's joined us from Indonesia. Um, and and uh, Dr. Laksono but if I'm not mistaken, the test that developed, mentioned by Dr. Moser, is based on nasopharyngeal saliva swab specimens. In dengue, we are relying on viremia. Um, and whilst the viremia could be a very short time, a short-lived uh, uh, time, I just wanted to ask whether this test is also influenced by the day of onset of fever. Curious to know whether it, in the saliva the load of viruses is as high as it in the blood. I don't know if you, if you want to, if you can answer that from your perspective or... Of course, so first of all I want to say Actually, our next step as a sample is to move to blood. So I imagine the dengue test would be on blood. Um, I actually am not aware of how much dengue viremia there is in saliva, but I think we would be moving to blood. Yeah. So you're on that direction in any Thank case, I'm sure that will yeah, that'll, that'll be, it's a great question. And thanks uh, Absolutely. for that. So that's, um, and that, that's great. Um, some questions there from Dr. Mohsin Khan again from, from Lahore in Pakistan. Does seasonal temperature variation affect its results? We've, we had to get the climate change question in there. We actually got a session tomorrow on climate change at this time go. tomorrow. But does seasonal, have you, ever, have you seen any kind of uh, effects or, or in terms of uh, seasonal temperature variations? It's such an important question when looking in Elmix, of course. Um, but no, so actually we've got lots of temperature sensors within the device to compensate for any environmental change so that's kind of part of the things i'm working on at the moment to make sure that there is no difference also it's actually quite shielded from from the outside because you're in a machine that has its own heat and then the, the reaction is you know within that little reaction chamber as well so we believe it won't that being said it will be part of the validations once we 
get the prototype going. Any of you can't. That's a, that's a great answer as well. Thank you for that. That's all the way out of South Africa to Brazil. Dr. Rodrigo Neves, uh, Neves de Oliveira. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Dr. De Oliveira. I believe that the biggest cost is equipment itself. From how many tests added to the equipment would be a better cost benefit compared to the test carried out today? Is there some kind of threshold in terms of how much multiplexing lowers the, the kind of cost benefit, uh, the ratio? Or is, is that something? No, it's so I can't give an exact number because we don't have all the all the costs at the moment, as I said, and it will be very different on the scale scaling of the test. But I think we're trying to break that vision of having this the very expensive device, as I said. So you know, it's not a sixty thousand dollar device. Um, we're trying to get down. In a way, um, the device is so inexpensive in this case that it should always almost be given for free, razor razor blade model, and then. The cartridge is actually cons consumable, so that's that's where the cost is, and it should not exceed the common, you know, Cephid or or Bifar platform still. So that should be a, a win win situation. And I suppose it comes back to something you said earlier in terms of getting the right partnerships in place, whether that's the manufacturing, whether that's for the, even the reagent side of things, and then that all adds to the scalability of it. So I suppose that you're definitely looking at that in, in any case. So that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, I, mean, I will say, however, in terms of, of test, of course, very quickly, it, if you compare it to a lateral flow test, it can never compete in terms of price, right? So a lateral flow test is essentially piece i mean again I'm, I'm going to exaggerate slightly but it's made of paper and yeah. it's mobile mentioned so comparing that to the complexity of a cartridge here can never be compared but that's why we're trying to find you know cases where what we need is accuracy and and speed and sensitivity in yeah. so I mean, that, that's the of, logic yeah and i think one of the uh, i'm just coming out of that for a second one of the very interesting points you guys you alluded to was this connectivity to various data the amazon server you set up for dengue Correct. Given that, and given the modular nature of everything, are there other kind of uh, databases that you can connect to to push into national disease surveillance, national dengue surveillance programs? Because that seems to be, that might be an area, I'm sure you're looking at this, obviously, but you know, you need governments on board, you've said that. Is that something you're exploring actively? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's quite challenges there because it seems like everybody has a different database. So that's why um, there's quite a few work to interfacing with, with the existing ones um, or, you know, create a global one. I'm not sure what the answer is. However, we are working also with a country called ProMet um, to, yeah. to also identify kind of how, how to do that best. Um, so um, definitely surveillance is a huge part of this as well. It's kind of the dawn of digital diagnostics and it's another um, feature I didn't mention it compared to natural flow tests um, having digital. This is why I wanted to kind of include you in this uh, particular meeting. I think we think it's absolutely, yeah. it's, you're so way ahead of the curve. And I'm sure everybody on this, the, the excellent audience we've got and people who are going to see this after in terms of release the video, are definitely going to um, have that in mind. So that's fantastic work and, and a big testament to the way you guys are doing things. It's brilliant. Um, that, that's that's pretty, uh, pretty good in terms of that. We're coming kind of towards the end, and I'm being told we have to kind of uh, say, um, I, what I wanted to ask you is this, partnerships is the key word, I think, that's coming out in people's minds in all of this, right? How easy are you guys to partner with? What's the pathway? And I'm talking to you with your Proton DX hat on, actually, because yeah. I, we know how challenging it is to get a startup finance and move, move that forward uh, to market, and you're doing that so successfully. How open are you to, you've got a diverse audience here, how open are you to being contacted, uh, partnerships, etc.? cetera? We're, we're very open. Um, I think that this, so, so we are a small startup, so we have 10-ish members of staff, half of us, um, also partly at Imperial. So we're still very new. However, I think we really want to make a difference and, and you know, get to it. So we, we see marked the product in nine months, which I think if you talk to a lot of companies, it's, it's quite a fast, fast route to market. Um, so there is, I mentioned the website, www.proton.x.com. Um, there is a contact email, so please feel free. You can also contact me, no problem. I will pass that, whichever. So we're very open. I think at the moment, our first product, the Dragfly, is kind of ready, can be taken for research use only for in any circumstance. Um, it doesn't need 
any um, particular approval even outside of the EU as long as it's research use only. So that can be done, no problem. For next thing, we're kind of still working on the automated prototypes in the start of next year. So then the work we're doing now is with DEDA network to kind of identify how to work on deployment and use testing and so on and so on. But until then, it'll be kind of a lot of development for us until we, we have it ready. We're absolutely open to any partnerships. It's so key, particularly now mix as we slowly, you know, recover from COVID and, and move on to to all these um, countries which we, we have at heart and, and want to help. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And I'm sure it's very encouraging for, for everybody here. Certainly di digital diagnostics are it's a new, the IMF are putting it forward as almost a new kind of employment route or a new sector that's you know about to start, which is very beneficial to the country that's partnering. So fantastic vista that's opening up there. Brilliant. Um, and I really do hope people do get in touch with you. I'm actually going to send you a separate email, Nicholas, because on the 16th, this particular meeting is the 13th, 14th, 15th. Then on the 16th, there's a closed meeting looking at COVID and uh, dengue, which I'm going to send you and uh, right. Professor Gregorio Pantelis a, 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 an email. Yes. About. You might want to get involved in that. Because certainly, some of the stuff is the okay. latest to that are superb. And there's a task force that's being built, so you might want to be part of that. Do that. Um, I we think we've come to the end, and I've been asked to kind of uh, that uh, to truncate everything now. So I just wanted to say, firstly, thank you very, very much to, to yourself, Nicholas. Uh, for a fantastic presentation, real eye-opener, way, way ahead of the curve. And I think this is, really is the future um, in terms of uh, diagnosis uh, in dengue, as well as other, uh, <laughs> other areas. So this is a, certainly a space to watch. We've had the pleasure of having various, um, how to put it, webinars and panel sessions with yourself, as well as the larger team, uh, Dr. Aubrey Cunnington, uh, as an example. Yes. Um, uh, I think... Um, Professor Pantelis uh, Gregoria yes. as well. Uh, so all of that's on our website. We can release all that's all in public domain. So anybody wants to get some further information on that, we'll certainly be putting some uh, Twitter action out. Uh, when, when, when and and really thanks good. to you and, and the ISNTD as well. It was my second talk with ISNTD as well, and it's always great. So thanks for the invitation. We, we really appreciate you saying that. You know, I have to also now be very kind to say thanks as well to the wider organizers of ADVA here, all of the, the, the heavy work. Uh, Marianne, the, the other co I'm one of the co-founders of the ISNTD, the International Society for NTDs. And Marianne Compre is the other one. She's in London. She's saying, thank you all. This has been a really energizing session showcasing work from brilliant teams. Much food for thought on the future of diagnostics. Hope to see you tomorrow for the next session on climate change, dengue and global health resilience at 17.30 Singapore time. And I'll be hosting that tomorrow. And I really do hope you can make it, Dr. Mosin Khan, you mentioned um, the effect of seasonal temperature variation. We've got a very interesting talk tomorrow from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, looking at prediction uh, with, uh, in terms of temperature, climate change, and predicting dengue outbreaks. The Lancet Commission people are on there as well. Um, for the details we released in the next few hours. But I really hope you can all make it for that. And again, have the chance to put your questions forward. I think it's very, very important. Thank you very, very, very much, uh, all of you, Dr. Neil Andrew Paul from MSD. Thank you. It was an amazing talk. So hats off, uh, Nicholas, to, to you and the whole team. Everybody's coming through. Dr. Laxono, thank you. Uh, everybody's coming through. And I'll send it to you saying thanks. Dr. Manuel Herath. Thank you, everyone. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. A large team as well and a, a big effort. So I'll pass on to the whole team. That's, that's fantastic. So, um, yeah. I hate saying goodbye, as you know, Nicholas, but I'm going to say it. Um, yeah, everybody take care of yourselves. Have a great uh, rest of the day. It's kind of evening here in Singapore, so I think we're going to have to go for a little walk um, and, and, and check some things out. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, guys, take care. Adios, everybody. Terima kasih to all the, the region and uh, peace. Take care, everybody. All right? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.